Welcome back to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Rogers. When it comes to medical conditions and healing, Christians hold a range of views from the intervention of doctors and medicine, alternative practices, and healing that comes from God. I'm not a doctor, and I would never use my podcast to offer medical advice, Um, but I would always encourage people like I would as a pastor to take a threefold approach to getting help. First, we always ask God to help us in all things. Secondly, we investigate and utilize good medicine. And thirdly, we look at alternative methods when the first two are not yielding a result that we can see. Some will try alternative before mainstream medicine, but that's, that's their choice. And I bring this up today uh, because as we consider the spiritual life of a person may be affected by both physical, mental, and spiritual conditions, I believe that God heals, and today's guest passes the test, in my mind, for a verifiable miracle from God. Uh, Josh Tamlin was healed of schizophrenia. And uh, we're going to hear his story and also learn about his present involvement in ministry. So welcome, Josh. Good to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me today, Kevin. It's a pleasure to connect with you at the Campus Summit and excited to see uh, what happens today. Yeah. So uh, you're recording from home, I gather? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) In my bedroom. All right. And uh, for our uh, listeners, uh, what city are you in? I'm in um, Burnaby, British Columbia. All right. Yeah. uh, You mentioned the Mission Canada Workers Retreat and and you were there uh, with uh, University Christian Ministries. So tell me about the campus that you serve on and some of the ways that you're involved uh, with, with students. Yeah, sure. So I work at BCIT, stands for British Columbia, British Columbia Institute of Technology. And essentially, um, uh, we operate as a club on campus and we um, integrate into the um, intricacies of the campus life. And we uh, provide a positive community on campus that is um, that leads people to faith and also helps people strengthen in their faith. And I, uh, I do get to meet some of the other folks that you work with in, uh, in uh, UCM and uh, an incredible tribe and uh, also part of the larger Serve Campus Network. We'll uh, be sure to put links uh, to those ministries in the show notes. Um, uh, you and I had a chance to really meet each other for the first time um, at, in Abbotsford when we were at the Mission Canada Workers Summit and the Surf Campus Network Summit. And uh, um, as uh, we got comfortable sharing and talking, um, and I started asking you a bit about your life, uh, and I uncovered an incredible journey that you've been on. So um, maybe we can just uh, get right to it and go back to the beginning. Um, you know, before any mental health diagnosis. Let's talk about your early years as a child and, and a young man and you know, as a teen and some of the things uh, that were um, things you had to live with and, and grow through and deal with. Um, maybe if there was anything that was kind of traumatic in childhood that you want to share about. Um, I would say that um, for the most part, I had like a pretty like you know normal modern family where um my parents loved each other um until i was about nine and then they had some financial difficulties and that caused them to drift apart they actually got separated and divorced my dad remarried um by from like nine to 14 um my mom who had custody of us uh went from like home to home to home um we just didn't really have a stable environment growing up and that caused me to like get into the drug scene and party scene and um I started working full-time by age 14 um 
based on the fact that between nine and 14, I think I'd lived in about 27 different places. And so, you know, there's no civility growing up. And so I felt like I kind of had to grow up quickly and, you know, kind of raise myself. And um, there were some difficulties there because um, as a, as a young person um, who needs to be disciplined and have some sort of like order, I had to kind of just figure everything out on my own just to survive. And so um, I think by age um, 15, 16, um, I started to get like noticed at like in like a, like a professional setting. And I started to get promotions in my workplace. And so due to those promotions, I was able to actually become like self-sustainable. Um, and by 16, I was a sous chef, uh, working at, uh, some, some different restaurants in Victoria. And that's, it, that's on the Island, Vancouver Island in, in BC. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, so by six, uh, I think I was 17 when my mom just, um, she randomly moved out of the place that I was staying. And so I ended up kind of like not telling my dad, but I probably should have. And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm basically an adult. And so I, um, found a, um, a place downtown with a landlord that didn't check ID and so um, I started living in this very sketchy apartment where the landlord was actually um, a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, he got raided several times while I was there. And so on that sort of progression, um, I, you know, making advances in work and, um, you know, going, finishing uh, high school, going to college um getting a first year under my belt with culinary school um I was actually offered a full ride to a um a culinary school in Vancouver but I never took it um but yeah so um <clears throat> that's that's uh, kind of my early story yeah you know that uh that's uh you know maybe um not a common story for a 14 year old kid to be working to help help pay the bills and uh, being uh, successful at, at, by the time you're 16, being a sous chef and and uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know without the structure and and you know kind of drifting into the party scene and drugs. How, what what kind of things were going on there? Yeah, so um, I kind of felt. Did it help I, having a having a dealer for a landlord? <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely, um, you know, supply and demand, right? And, yeah, you know, convenience of just walking downstairs versus you know um, going out to get it, I guess. But um, <clears throat> I think for me, it's like um, some of the thing that kind of attracted me to that party scene was, um, well, you know, uh, women, but also um, uh, friends. And so, um, because I was moving from place to place to place growing up, I didn't have that form of stability. I was always like an outsider. And so it was hard to, um, develop like a social life. And so, um, through like social smoking, um, I was able to connect with a lot of people like way deeper than I had before. And so that kind of, you know, was a slippery slope of course. And, uh, yeah. How how bad did it get for you in terms of drug use? <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I won't go into the uh, like the minor details, but um, I was I wasn't doing any like hard drugs. The only hard drug I did was mushrooms, mm -hmm. and that was when I was like sixteen, mm -hmm. and um, I did it once, and I was like, that was not a good experience. So I just sucked sucked to uh, to marijuana. And uh, turns out that's uh, what turned the tide, actually. So, mm. I even in that scene with my friends doing like coke and e and MDMA, and I was, I I just thought they were dumb. <laughs> I was yeah. like, "You're ruining your life." That's what I was, you know. That was my thought process at 14. So, thank yeah. you, Lord. Yeah, there is certainly some uh, literature and opinion that. Uh, 
marijuana weed can uh, can trigger um, uh, paranoia responses in people and and uh, could could activate a, a sequence of mental health uh, failure and was that uh, part of part of the story you think for you yeah so i had onset psychosis which was triggered from the marijuana use mm -hmm. and i didn't actually notice it until i was about 19 working as a chef and uh ended up actually losing my job um mm -hmm. because i was distracted i was like hearing these voices that were telling me um to like make the food a certain way and you know like i you know somebody asked for like a, a medium rare steak in a restaurant it better be medium rare because they're paying top dollar mm -hmm. and you know um i you know i you know i heard a voice where i thought the server said to make it medium well and then so i make it medium well and then they bring it back and they're upset and i'm like well hmm i thought you just asked for it medium well <laughs> And so eventually I thought I was getting like followed to work um, because of the um, psychotic episode. And uh, <clears throat> eventually um, my bosses knew, noticed a change in me and um, they, uh, they let me go. So what happened and what were you experiencing around the time of being uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia? So um, it was kind of interesting because it was the first year that I felt like I was truly independent working as a chef and, um, you know, having lots of friends and, um, you know, having like some sort of financial stability. And um, all of a sudden, you know, things just started, started like waves were crashing and, you know, I'm fearing all, all of a sudden I'm feeling this like tremendous fear of what's happening and um i felt like i was losing my mind and i was like no i you know just calm down like nothing like <laughs> I, I, I was like you know if god's not real then that means demons aren't real right and so at that point in my life i kind of made the decision to think that god wasn't real and that i was you know this professed atheist that you know um, had this night nightly prayer ritual, which was kind of interesting, but yeah, an atheist with a nightly prayer ritual. <laughs> yeah. So did just the, in case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, uh, so like when, like uh, your your boss uh, let you go from work because you were getting unstable. You were hearing. Uh, voices that were going contrary to reality um, but what else was going on and and when did it all kind of come to uh, to a head when did you realize oh I got a really serious problem here um so it was a couple things so I couldn't perform at work I was constantly um, in this like manic like um, I was on honestly going like catatonic if that makes sense. So I was kind of sitting there and I'm um, like terrified. And I started to actually see, um, you know, demons. And so I was like, okay, well, um, this is interesting. And so, you know, and it, it started to happen when I was, when I was high and I was like, you know what, maybe I'm just still high. And then like, it, it would happen throughout the day when I wasn't using and then um, fast forward, I'm sitting in my apartment, had just lost my job and I'm like panicked. And I, I feel like I'm in this like sort of um, state where I'm like, you know, it's bedtime, I'm going to sleep, you know, plan in the morning is to get up, make some resumes, go hand them out, get a new job. Because anytime I needed a new job, anytime somebody, you know, thought they knew better than me i would just literally just go to their uh their competition and work for their competition i could just like in victoria i was notorious for just leaving a kitchen and then going across the street and working for their competitor yeah and like i just get hired on the spot like yeah. without you know um but you know in this sort of um 
aspect of like, oh, you know, they they clearly made a mistake because you know I'm I'm fine, I'm fine, <laughs> and so I, I remember I'm sitting in my room and um, I go into this sort of like lucid dream and um, or should I say lucid nightmare because um, I can't move, I'm like frozen in fear, and I start to see these like um, beings approaching me, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is strange like uh and then they start like shouting these profanities in you know all languages i don't understand that kind of sound like metal music to be honest and then also like um you know yelling things at me that are like attacking my like soul and like my character and diminishing me and um i am just frozen in fear i can't move and then um, they're approaching me and they're like uh, at arm's length about to like strangle me and then I said I said you know what I'm just gonna throw a Hail Mary here I said Jesus if you're real please please get rid of these guys and then all of a sudden I saw this hand reach in the room and it just tore out the demons and they sorry <laughs> and they, they just um, they started shrieking in pain and I was like holy crap jesus is real <laughs> and so i'm like 19 years old at the time and i'm like uh you know i i better get some help and so um you know i'm like oh but i'll do it tomorrow so i'm like i'm getting up and i'm getting ready for the day and um i feel this like feeling that someone's following me with like malice intent and i'm i i'm walking downtown and this is like a 30 minute walk that i would make daily and i feel that they're getting closer and closer and closer i'm like um and you know i'm like almost taunting these things back in my head like you can't catch me i'm you know really fast and so i just took off just running and i used to be um uh, like pretty athletic I was like 140 and you know I I could run 10k like it was nothing and so I'm I beeline it downtown I'm there within three minutes and I get to the front of the uh the bay center there and I'm just out of breath because I just you know basically ran um it was like three kilometers in a span of like you know maybe it was not three minutes but either way so i get downtown in front of the bay center and um i start to see these things approaching me and um at this point i wasn't certain if they were um like corporeal if that makes sense so like people and i assumed that they were people and so i see these and at this point in time i'm I'm kind of like shrugging off that like lucid dream is like maybe it was like a dream warning me of something that's going to happen. And so, you know, um, I'm, I see these policemen. I'm like, these guys are chasing me. They're trying to kill me. And I'm pointing, you know, at these people. And the the cops are like, this guy's crazy. Like, we don't see anybody there. And then, so they put me in the back of this paddy wagon and then they take me to the uh, psych ward. So I got the help I needed. And so I'm sitting in this like padded room and um, I'm like basically waiting. They're like, this guy's manic. Like he's, you know, ex you know, ex exhibiting the, you know, X, Y, Z. Like we need to make sure that he doesn't hurt himself or hurt somebody else. So they put me in this four padded, like four wall padded room. And then the first thing that happens is there's this big security guard. He's probably like 250 and like much taller than me, much stronger than me. And he's, he comes in the room and he's got this like, um, he's probably got like Ativan in this like needle that they're trying to inject me with. And um, I get the silly idea that I want to fight these guys. And so he comes back with like 10 other guys and I'm like bouncing off the wall, like kicking off and like somersaulting and like wrestling these guys. And then, I just get pinned to the floor with like tremendous force because I'm like way smaller than these guys. Like there's no, there's no way I should be doing this, but you know, I was just an idiot. And so um, they pin me down and they, they, um, they shoot me with probably out and then 
I'm sitting there just like, just completely like, um, without emotion and just kind of um, empty. And I'm, you know, taking the time because I they, they sat me in this room for probably a day before they let me out with just like meals or whatever. And it's not jail, so technically they can't hold you for too long. But so they're they're feeding me meals or whatever, and then um. I'm I'm sitting there kind of like self-reflecting on like the past like week of events and I'm just thinking to myself like maybe maybe Jesus is real because if they didn't see what was there and like people don't normally see like demons um you know there's you know you know I've seen um movies like or or TV shows like Touched by an Angel or whatever for the people in the older audience or you know, angels in the outfield, that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, it's not something that typically like Westerners um, talk about or are open to talk about. And so um, I end up getting diagnosed uh, within that day with uh, schizophrenia. And um, oddly enough, the person who diagnosed me was like, um, the most experienced psych uh, psychiatric doctor um, in North America for the past like 60 years, um, specifically around the illness, schizophrenia. And it's like, this guy is exhibiting all of the signs. Like it's a no brainer. Like I've been dealing with this for years. Like it's like, we need to just get him on the medicine and get him help. And so um, the funny thing is like half of the meetings I'm telling this guy he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like you know he's kind of like the guy that knows his stuff and so um yeah um how, how much how did you um <clears throat> like as you think think back on it and uh and what you've been through um how do you parse out whether it was actually demons or whether it was uh you know just a hallucination from uh you know brain chemistry uh not not doing what it's supposed to do like do you uh, do you wonder about that or how do you uh how do you determine i mean when if somebody who's schizophrenic says that um you know oh i'm uh the, this guy keeps showing up and he's telling me to do this and you know it's not a it's not an actual person like like this is this is such a mystery to people and uh how, but you know and, and i'm not asking you know to for you to figure it out for everybody else but for yourself how did you know it was demonic uh, and what part was demonic what part was uh an an actual disorder are you able to yeah so it? my my thought okay so you know don't sell me the wolves here but this is my kind of philosophy about you know the spiritual realm and um like east versus western ideologies regarding mental illness and so um i would say that mental illness and um spirits are synonymous it's just the way that the west describes them to remove the terrifying aspects of them and so um i think that when someone is ill and severely ill um you need to pray of course like you said um but you also need to um go through like the process with the medication because the medication i would say for me kind of like grounded me it landed me in a place where i could then go from the like you know zero to hero right mm -hmm. you can and, connect, connect the dots thought control yeah and so like um because with the illness like your brain receptors are going like it's imagine um you're in like a pinball machine but like the ball is going like a thousand times fast and that's like how many thoughts you're having per second and so your brain receptors are just like severely overworked so the medication um slowing you down is actually well they're called antipsychotics which essentially is just like 
um it's like putting a slow on your thought process that kind of like grounds you to a position where you, then you can like work from there and mm -hmm. so the difficulty with a lot of this stuff is it um kind of makes you catatonic if you don't work for it like don't work towards a better future if that makes sense right right it, it can address a um <clears throat> uh, a brain activity thing but it can't touch anything to deal with your your spirit or your yeah. your purpose and your your wholeness right yeah. yeah and so i think that when we're dealing with mental illness we need a holistic approach mm -hmm. um sorry approach not reproach um <laughs> 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 totally different things my bad so when you are dealing with mental illness i think the holistic approach looks similar to um recognizing that um we are in a fallen world where um you know many things can be damaged you know look at the, the war in the world so that we've got the physical damage also you have like individuals that are born like handicapped like missing limbs um that wasn't god's original purpose but that's the cause of the fall and then you have um, emotional problems people are like manic bipolar that kind of stuff that's not god's original design for them but it's just where they're at um will god heal them he might mm -hmm. if it's for his glory um are they serving god hopefully um can they serve god 100 percent um mental illness i would say that the approach with mental illness is like um yeah i would say that i would refrain from just going around like i had this genius idea when like god healed me i was like you know what why don't i just go into the um psych ward and then start casting out demons because i'm re reading that in the scripture i'm like no maybe not because i don't want to get thrown in jail because that would be pretty intense mm -hmm. But I think that the um, perspective is like, if someone gives me the permission um, to pray and like, you know, ask God to remove things that aren't intended to be there, I'm 100% going to do that. Actually, after this summit where we met, um, I was going to a partner meeting in, in Brentwood Mall and um, this person called me over because they, they knew who I was and um their friend had actually asked me to like um basically this person was experiencing early signs of schizophrenia and um they asked me to do like a, an intervention or an exorcism and i'm like i don't know what that is but you know um you know i'll just tell you it worked for me and then i prayed with her and at, originally um i felt this like sort of like fear and tear and like uncertainty and uncomfortable like aspects and so many things that were just not supposed to be there there like there's multiple if that makes sense mm -hmm. um sort of like when you read the scriptures about legion so I, I i you know i i took that into account when i started to pray in the opposite spirit so um fear courage you know um hate love right and right. so you know um where there's um contention peace and so when you pray in the opposite spirit, you you remove the enemy's ability to have a foothold on that person's life. And so, mm -hmm. um, but you also got to keep in mind um, um, in the, in the pair, in like the new Testament, it talks about when you clean the house, you got to make sure you invite the Holy spirit into all those areas. Otherwise the demons are just going to bring back more friends. Oh, Hey, look, you cleaned up the place. Like what you done with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, now my friends are going to have a party and destroy it. Well, it's so, yeah. it's really intriguing, Josh. Like you're um, you're in your apartment. You're an atheist um, with with a prayer ritual. <laughs> Is was that just kind of like just in case kind of praying? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So here's the thing. So I believe that that prayer actually protected me for a long time. Um, but it was the moment that I stopped praying that that's when the enemy came in. Hmm. So, um, a little bit about my, um, pre pre story. So when my mom was pregnant with me, um, she had these birth complications and 
she had something called placenta previa where there's like a tear on the line of the uterus and basically she was given like a seven percent chance for her to live um and zero percent for me hmm. and so you know like you know any good um christians they brought it to the church and they prayed and um do you know the guy that wrote the cross and the switchblade david wilkerson yeah so apparently that guy was connected with my parents church in ontario where the uh markham's pastor and um he actually made a saint trip Catherine's. over yeah. yeah so he made a trip over to saint Catherine's general hospital to pray over my mom and then when i was uh born uh, he came back and he prophesied over me actually wow. i don't know what he said my mom said she never wrote it down at the time i should honestly ask my dad what he said because who knows maybe he remembers but you know she's like i was so bad at taking notes at that time i'm like hey same i'm bad at taking notes now i need to start writing some stuff down with all the cool stuff that god's doing but um um i believe that there um so the, basically the gist of what my mom remembered was that um god saved me for a purpose mm. and so that purpose was about to actualize and then the enemy was trying to stop it mm. and so um when i stopped praying i was like you know what i don't know if i actually believe if this is real and you know i'd been to church like four times since i was nine years old at the age of 18 and so or 19 rather and so i'm sitting there and i'm like well um yeah i had a nightly prayer ritual it seemed contra contradictive and i was like you know i don't like hypocritical people um i don't think it actually makes sense for me to continue praying because i don't actually think this is doing anything and um when i stopped that's when the enemy came in wow wow um <clears throat> at what point uh did you make a decision uh that uh yeah jesus is real and uh i'm going to give give my life to to jesus i'm gonna stop trying to figure it out on my own i'm gonna i'm gonna be a disciple when did that happen i would say that um when i was in um so I ended up being admitted to the psychiatric ward for about three weeks after mm -hmm. that, like one day stay in paradise, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, my dad was the first person to show up to meet me. It wasn't any of the, you know, hundreds of friends that I connected with. They all were aware of what was going on because, uh, you know, I had a very um, uh, intrusive friend post about it on Facebook. And, um, you know, so everybody knew. And, um, yeah, so, um, none of my friends showed up to, to meet with me. And so my dad shows up and, um, with him was this, um, young Korean man and he had a Bible with him and he handed it to me and, um, he, he actually had schizophrenia as well. And this was one of the years where he was actually doing well with the schizophrenia and so he was he was there and he was there to encourage me and um i you know i went to i got like a nightly pass on like week two and i was able to attend like a church service and um that was a really special time because the guy who was speaking um got free of like drugs and alcohol and he was pastoring and i i heard the lord say that's gonna be you one day and i said no it's not it's not no it's not it's no way and so I remember I'm, um, I'm sitting alone in the, um, the hotel room, let's call it. And, um, you know, there's like very little privacy in this area. Cause you're basically just in like hospital beds in with like a bunch of other like strangers and, um, you know, people are having all sorts of like nightly terrors and stuff like that. And it's really traumatic. And so I'm sitting there and um, so I, I turn on the light of my phone and um, I've kind of got it like resting um, between my legs and kind of like shining up on my chest as I'm like reading 
like I opened the Bible for the first time and oddly enough opened it right to uh, Joshua 1 and um, the first verse my eyes fall on is Joshua 1 9 it says um, for I've commanded you be strong and courageous do not be discouraged or terrified for the Lord will be with you wherever you go and in this moment of hearing like all of these nightly terrors like the other people around me and like feeling like fearful and like uncertain of what the future looks like because because I've just been giving this like lifetime diagnosis, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm terrified. And all of a sudden, when I read that, I just felt like clothed in peace. And so I said, um, Jesus, I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. And it, I don't know what that looks like, but um, I want to do great things for you. And I'm not content with um, this label they've put on me. Hmm. Wow. So you made your decision to follow Jesus while you're being hospitalized. And, uh, you know, the, it's incredible. Like he, when you go back to the the story of, you know, being in your apartment and terror, terrified as you see these demons, Jesus, if you're real, you got to take these away and the hand and the shrieking and away they go. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, it, it, that's an interesting place when Jesus says, come follow me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you could say that. Yeah. So, uh, hospitalized, uh, on, on medication, I assume now, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, how long, uh, did you have that, uh, diagnosis? And what did you do with your life during those years that you were diagnosed? Yeah, so um, in the beginning years, when I got released from the hospital, I racked up loads of credit card debt because of things going to collection and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, um, I just basically racked up this mountain of debt because I wasn't working and I wasn't earning any income. and. Um, I had to get a job to pay rent and all this kind of stuff. I, you know, wasn't living with family um, still at that point. Um, and so I basically um, went back to working in kitchens and, but because I was on medication, I was a lot slower. So I had to relearn a lot of things and, um, you know, still super prideful at this time. So I wasn't willing to take direction from a lot of the people. So that wasn't uh, super great. Um, and so in the early years of taking the medication, I felt really slowed. And like, I felt like the things that I knew how to do, I was like quickly forgetting. Um, and when it came to giving instruction or like telling people to do things in kitchens or um, even having just basic conversations, I actually had to relearn everything. Um, I felt like I went back to square one in terms of social skills. And that was something that I was really strong in beforehand. And it was difficult because uh, I'd be trying to construct a sentence and then um, I would have this like long pause and the person would interrupt and never get a word in. Um, or, it, I, you know, I'd be getting in like, like, you know, sort of like a broken record situation where I have like a rehearsed you know, statement that I'd say, or like question that I ask people. And so I guess in church circles at the time, I became one of those like extra grace required people. Um, and so those people might be in your church today. So just keep in mind, God, God might have a plan for their story. Did you feel uh, extremely alone uh, once, once you were diagnosed? Yeah, because I was trying to get off of drugs at the time because I recognized the evil in them. And I felt like when I was smoking pot, I wasn't actually opening like a portal to for like these things to, you know, come into, you know, the areas of my life that, you know, I was kind of like closely guarding. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I found like I lost a lot of friends and um, I was trying to gain friends in the church realm. Um, 
but the only ones that were willing to because i went to this really big church and so everybody was like this sunday christian super like superficial smile they have no idea about spiritual gifts they just attend there kind of like a country club and so there's like this massive revolving door where people are like um very hyper focused about becoming successful getting like a um a beautiful wife and you know settling down and then ignoring all their friends and that was kind of like the, the culture that i was in and i found that like i became disassociative really quickly with that scene because you know i'm struggling with a mental illness i'm in no place to get in a relationship um and nor did i want to put that burden on a spouse um so at least i had the the wits to avoid that scenario completely mm -hmm. and um yeah during during the time of uh being medicated and treated uh did you have uh more of those encounters of uh, seeing uh, demons or did that uh go away and something else take its place like what was what else was happening then so I stopped seeing demons when I accepted Jesus into my life, mm -hmm. but um, I still heard them. I still felt their evil presence lurking. And so anytime I felt their evil presence lurking, I would, I would pray and I'd say, Lord, in your name, I pray that you just remove these demons. Or I just say, um, I, I I would sometimes I'd get like a word of like what it was or like I'd feel what it was and I you know kind of creepy crawly and I'd say spirit of fear I command you in the name of Jesus I rebuke you go go away <laughs> like that kind of thing right yeah, and yeah. so I didn't really know what I was doing um but you know you kind of like figure it out as you go and also like I don't know anybody in in North America that's done something like this or like prayed for miracle healings oh yeah by the way that's one of my other gifts <laughs> <laughs> yeah so would would you um during uh, those times it was uh you know you're you're really being taught weren't you by this by the holy spirit how to how to um navigate through that spiritual darkness yeah so um, you know, if you look at Psalm 23, it's like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. You comfort me, comfort me yeah. and you protect me, you guide me. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. as I'm walking through this like spiritual unknown, um, just fully reliant on Jesus, because I have no idea what's going to happen. There's, you know, I've, uh, you know, in, in the early days, I made several Google searches trying to figure out if like there was gears for schizophrenia and there wasn't any known to man. And then I'm like reading in the gospels and I'm like, God, you like gotten rid of this legion and, you know, cast out these demons and you tell us to do that. Why can't you heal me? And I said, I will not do your work until you heal me. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I remember hearing this distinct, you know, voice saying like, Josh, your heal healing is already written. Just keep pressing forward. And so um, in this scenario, in these like times where I was so resistant to what God wanted me to do, it actually took me five years to realize that I was supposed to go to Bible college to get some training. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, um, well, let's, let's talk about that. You know, you, you had this, this sense of direction forming this sense of purpose after, uh, dedicating your life to, to Jesus. And, uh, then, uh, when you went to Bible college, were, were you still, um, on your meds? Were you still under diagnosis or, uh, yeah what was going on I wasn't on there. killed at that point yeah <laughs> so you went to went to bible college but uh, you were medicated you were getting help but and and the the spirit of god was was teaching you how to how to live 
uh, with within that darkness and find your way through right yeah so one of the contingent contingencies for summit actually um allowing me to continue my courses was is like they wanted to make sure that i was upholding the government standards that they required me to do with taking the medication and you yeah. know you know it totally makes sense like yep. yeah that's a great you know that's yeah, a great gen generally bar. speaking you don't want uh people with schizophrenia um uh acting out manifesting that disease in yeah. in uh settings that are uh designed to to learn right yeah and yeah. so um there still was some of that that happened on campus mm -hmm. some of the faculty had to step up and usher these people into counseling and mm -hmm. having them take year-long breaks when they got yeah. help and you know they weren't discouraging these people going into no, ministry or they going were caring through. for them yeah and so that was really um encouraging yeah. um when i started to um you know see some of the doctors over here um so a couple of weeks into um bible college the first doctors oh actually sorry let me let me um circle back to a a uh, prophetic word that was spoken over me before I went because it's relevant here. Yeah. So um, I'm in this prayer group and, um, you know, I have this friend who um, he, he was like one of the guys that um, he would spend like five hours a day in prayer because he didn't work. And, you know, he's like, you know, I'm not going to work unless Jesus tells me to. I'm like, get off your butt, you lazy you know <laughs> and so he had he's like josh i have this this word from god for you and he said um jesus is going to heal you of your mental illness i'm like thanks well-meaning christian but i'm not going to just go off my medication if that's what you're suggesting and he said no no no, no. uh the second part is a doctor is going to confirm it so when i went to bible college uh, I had three doctors in a row tell me that I should get a second opinion because they don't um, they don't believe that I have schizophrenia anymore. Hmm. And they're like, I don't, you know, I they're like, I'm not versed in this area, but this is the sense that I get when I talk to you. And like when I usually deal with those people, they are like this and you're like this and, you know, you're full of peace and joy. and You're always like making me laugh, but like, you know, versus not right. And like they could just tell by the the mannerisms and the maturity that you know something had changed, and they're like, you should get this looked at. And then the third one, he said, this medication is having adverse effects in your body, and it's actually shortening your lifespan. Um, I need you to get the second opinion. But the second opinion was going to cost all sorts of money that I didn't have as a broke college student, and so I was like. Um, yeah, that's great, doctor, but I can't afford to get a second opinion. And he's like, well, because this is like a life and death situation, I'm going to expedite this and just pay for it myself. I was like, what? <laughs> and so I ended up seeing the psychiatrist and it was this Muslim lady. And I basically just told her how Jesus healed me. And um, yeah, she had you know, she's like, oh, that's really neat. Like, huh. She's like, I've never had this situation before because it's never been documented. It's never happened before. Oh, hello. Uh, have you met Jesus? <laughs> so. So uh, three, three doctors all verifying that uh, we don't think you're schizophrenic yeah yeah so that that uh recommendation then was to the muslim doctor yeah and yeah. yeah and and what what was her uh verdict yeah she said that you don't have this did she suggest that you had any anything else or just that you don't have that or literally nothing she said that um you know as i examine you i you know it like 
she said that when I look at the notes of my predecessor, who was one of her teachers at one point, by the way, that's how well known this guy was. Um, she's like, clearly he knew what he was doing. But when I look at you today and I see the changes by the way you act now versus how you acted in your chart, um, it doesn't seem like you're the same person. And um, I can't help but think that um, you've been you've been cured. And this is an incurable illness. And so she's kind of like, what's going on? So the verdict was that I've been healed. Mm, wow. So she, um, for the next six months, weed me off my medication, met with me a couple times. And yeah, I actually just got to share my faith with her of how I found Jesus through, um, like the medication helped, but what really helped was connecting with the faith and mm. Jesus and praying whenever I'd have these moments and it eventually, you know, I'm here and you're saying that I'm cured. So when, when you, so this would have been happening, uh, during your time at Bible college. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so you got weaned off the medication and um have you had uh um how long has that been now uh so it's been five years five years yeah um have you um uh, had any uh any relapses or any uh times where you you went back to uh, that state of mind no not at all wow. yeah uh, I I think that's verifiable. <laughs> I mean, I think your uh, your doctor's advice is is trustworthy, and it wasn't just a random doctor; it was a series of doctors. No. That, um, now, being healed from such a dramatic condition is one thing, but learning now how to how to live uh, after being through I I think this is a very traumatic traumatic event for anybody to go through and and uh it it had to be devastating uh but by god's grace you experienced healing and what's it like learning to live in reality and deal with the mundane uh things of life uh, things like uh, re relationships, um, you, you were in a, a very dissociative state, but now you can associate. Um, you were in a, a state where you, you couldn't hold, hold on to a job and you couldn't comprehend it. But now what's, how, how have you had to learn to catch up for lost time uh, mm -hmm. what's what's the mundane everyday life like for you now so one of the uh quotes that i've kind of taken with me and uh, i don't think this was written by anybody but essentially um i you know allowing god to kind of you know chisel away at the things that you don't want him to being humble enough to realize that you're not enough has allowed me to turn my greatest weaknesses into my greatest strengths. Um, even with communication, uh, before I got saved and um, healed, I I was a I was a teenager. I wasn't amazing at communication. I wasn't. Um, I, in fact, it was probably more military style communication uh, with how kitchens work. Um, but you know, in my early walk with schizophrenia and the lord um healing me of that um it took me a really long time to adjust from the whole like this is how you can talk to um people in kitchens this is how you can talk to um people in the church realm this is how you talk to people in the church realm in the kitchen you know and so um i ruffled a lot of feathers i upset a lot of people uh, I apologize profusely, um, and I slowly got better. Um, but I think if you are satisfied with where you're at, you, like you never stop growing. So mm -hmm. life is a journey, 
um, where you're going to make so many mistakes, but that's exciting because you have the opportunity to become better and be the best version of yourself while allowing Christ to be reflected in your daily walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you um, say to um, if, if somebody's uh, listening or watching this on YouTube and uh, if, if they uh, are dealing with schizophrenia or a friend or a family member is dealing with it, what what would you uh, how would you encourage people uh, to uh, to to bring faith to bear uh, yeah. in 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 that context and and not only faith but uh, I would say understanding and wisdom you know some of those things what 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 would you share to others who are trying now to figure out what the heck is going on? Um, I would say that my traumatic event, you know, the traumatic course of events that happened in my life because of schizophrenia were a blessing because without that blessing, I would never have met Jesus. Um, and Jesus was, was ultimately the one that can free you. I would say that for the person listening who isn't a believer, um, I commend you in your walk and I, I salute you. And I pray that you would find a faith um, and prayers don't have to be super complicated. If you're ever confused of how to pray, just look at the Lord's prayer. You know, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. This is the important part. Give us our, our daily bread and forgive us, forgive others as we forgive, you know, as you've forgiven us. And so, and in the, these sort of steps of like trying to navigate, like, how do I pray? Sometimes the most powerful prayer is Jesus help me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you're going through a storm or, you know, you um, imagine um, Jesus is BCAA and you just locked your keys in your car and it's this stormy night and you're trying to get home and, um, you call up VCA and then he's right there and they let you into your car because they're, you know, good at doing those things. The, but, uh, yeah. Oh, British Columbia automobile association. Yeah. 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 So I'm, <laughs> I hope you have something like that. Cause those are cool. We do. We have CAA. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, yeah. um, yeah, sorry. There's my, um, my Westerner part coming yeah. up. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say that like, Sometimes when we're in the middle of the storm, it is actually our privilege and our blessing to remember to pray um, because um, when God shows up, he shows up in power and it's always for a purpose and your, your life has purpose, your life has meaning and don't ever let any voice or any thought ever protrude or diminish you because you're so much better than that. Jesus loves you. Mm. Um, in the, the show notes uh, for uh, people that go to sidewalkskylinepodcast.com, I'm going to put a link uh, to your uh, Mission Canada profile page. Um, <clears throat> you do raise uh, your own support mm -hmm. as a university Christian ministries worker. And uh, I think that uh, it would be uh, great to, to see you have all that you need to, to thrive and do what you do. And uh, uh, I just want to say, Josh, thanks so much for, uh, for being on and, and, and just being so uh, authentic and transparent and, and, and humble. Like uh, people don't always like to be open about what they've been through and and how they've been broken but mm. uh, you did a really great uh service to to me and to others who will listen by saying this is what i was experiencing this is what i was going through this is the the simple things that i did and the things that i learned so thank you josh and uh 
I know that um, uh, that you'll never doubt that uh, God heals because you're living it firsthand. Come on. And uh, for those who uh, are not healed, for those who are wondering if God ever will heal, um, I always think about the words of the Apostle Paul who prayed three times that God would remove the, the, the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him. And God's answer was an answer that was better than healing, according to God. He said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So if we don't have our healing, we can always have his grace to, to hold us together for another day, to get us through to the next day. But I love, I love the fact that in the midst of your storm, uh, you learned how to pray. You learned how to, how to recognize what was going on and, and, and speak, uh, speak in prayer to that reality. And uh, amazing. Thanks, Josh. And yeah. uh, I hope, Hope we get to uh, connect again sometime. Look forward to it, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. What a beautiful story of healing, Josh Tamblin. You know, on the streets of most of our cities, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, people that are wandering around struggling uh, with mental health, homelessness, uh, various addictions, and uh, not uh, the size of the city doesn't seem to uh, affect the severity. Uh, if you go to a small uh, beach city like Leamington, uh, a city in southwestern Ontario that is known for its uh, greenhouses and Heinz ketchup and, and things like that, um, there's uh, just, uh, just as severe of uh, issues on the street as you would find in, in somewhat larger cities. And uh, so on our next episode, I'm gonna be talking with Jennifer Hyde. Jennifer is the executive director of the Leamington Community Hope Center. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, a, a new uh, street mission, basically, a drop-in center founded uh, just in the last year. And uh, they've had uh, quite an exciting uh, beginning as an organization and uh, we're going to hear all about it on the next episode so please come back and until then i'm your host kevin rogers and you're listening to sidewalk skyline podcast <laughs>